Okay, we're gonna go over the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, guys, it's fundamental. There are, I believe, five theorems. I call this two theorems: fundamental theorem part one and part two. You have the mean value theorem, the intermediate value theorem, max min existence theorem. And there's two parts of the mean value theorem, by the way. And those are the only theorems you have to know. So we need to know the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is going to be embedded in several problems. It'll be on the multiple choice. And it could be in two different uh, free response questions. It's hard to say. So this one's not bad. What's the integral of f prime of x? It's f of x. And then what, what will we do? We'll evaluate it at a and b. This is called a definite integral. And Riemann discovered that it's the same as evaluating the function at b minus evaluating the function at a. You kind of know that one, I think. You feeling comfortable with that part? It's the next part where we have some problems. Is that okay? Another name for it is the evaluation theorem. We'll do some problems. Do you remember how to take the derivative of an antiderivative? What do these guys do? They cancel each other out. And you take this x and you substitute it right in there for t. So this is f of x. If you were to integrate this, you would have f, some antiderivative evaluated at x minus some antiderivative evaluated at a. What's the derivative of the antiderivative evaluated at a, a constant? It's zero. That's why there's no a in here. So if you understand what's going on, it makes it a lot easier. Okay? If it was, a, if it was a derivative from a to b, those would both be constants, so this would be zero. So one has to be a variable. And I don't think they're going to give you something with two variables. It'll look just like this. Because so we'll, we'll do a problem and I'll show you. Is, is x a variable? Yes. So not a no, it's a variable. So what about this one? If you were to anti-differentiate this, you would get some function of g of x. So the derivative and the integral will cancel each other out. So do you remember we're going to get f of g of x? But because this antiderivative would be a composite function, and it would be evaluated at g of x, so when you take the derivative of a composite function with an inside function of g of x, we have to use the what rule? No, not product, chain rule. We have to take it times the derivative of that upper limit. Now, this type of problem will be multiple choice. The other will be... Um, for your response. I gotta find my hang on, it might be in my cart. Okay, so I'm gonna pause this for a second. You would take the f of t and you put this in there. If you were to anti-differentiate this, you would have d dx of capital F of g of x minus capital F of a. We're okay with f of a because that's the derivative is just going to be zero. But when you take the derivative of this, you'll get f prime of g of x times the derivative of the inside function. That's why the g prime is there. It is, but then we're taking the derivative. Notice we have two things together here. We have a derivative and antiderivative. They cancel each other out. The biggest problem is to realize you substitute in g of x and to multiply by g prime of x. But if you remember, it's because the antiderivative is evaluated there, and when you differentiate that composite function, you have to do the chain rule. That should help. Bring your multiple choice packets. You should have done 2008, 2003. That's the missing page in 2003. This week, 1998, which is similar to what's in the lab. Next week, 1997, you'll have all the multiple choice packets done that I have. 
I can go back to 93, but they've changed a lot. So we are going to do 1995. And usually when it says it's the sixth problem, people think it's hard, but I don't think it's that hard. And I'm sorry about the way it's typed. It's just a, the way it works. Okay. I don't even have my picture there. <laughs> you guys should you should be able to do this. It's one point. Are we supposed to be able to read this graph? Estimate it, but it, there won't be any question on the exam. But I don't even need a graph. What did I miss you? Well, well, we can get you some more. We may have some more. She doesn't need it. To say. Okay. Okay. Shh. Look, how do I find H of one? You should have this out. Oh, I just gave it to you. Just look at the graph. No. Nope. Oh, Easier than that. What do you mean? How can I you guess? Yeah, you can. It's h of 1. Just do follow what it says here. h of x is the area from 1 to x, so it's the area from 1 to 1. <laughs> it's from 1 to 1. X is 1. So if I wanted to do the area from 1 to 2, I'd be looking at the area under the curve. No, because guess what this is a graph of? Which, I'm sorry, it's not labeled, but this is F of T. Natalie. This is going to be H prime, that's right. Oh, why doesn't it say that? Because I probably typed it and didn't put it in. I'm telling you right now. Okay. X is, how am I going to do B? What? How am I going to do B? I want to find H prime of 4. On this one, you do the Well, H of X is the integral from 1 to X of F of T dt. How do I find the derivative of H? Why? I want to find what? The derivative of this. Now, because I'm going to take the derivative, what does the derivative do to that? Okay, so I've got h prime of x is equal to f of x. Guess what? You get a point for writing that down. And you get another point for finding h prime of 4. So what's h prime of 4? It's equal to f of 4. Okay, we're going to have to look at our graph as well as we can. And what's f of 4? Looks like it's about 2. And it will be clear on their graphs. That is another point. I know when you take the derivative of like, the integral, it's just the function behind the integral. But why is it like... Because if I were to integrate this, that would be some function of 1 and the derivative of a constant is 0. Because this would be capital F of X minus F of 1. And the derivative with respect to X, that's 0. This is constant. Okay, ready? Okay, shh. On what in Natalie. On what interval or intervals is the graph of H concave up? Justify your answer. So H is not defined. Well, I like to justify my answer first because then it tells me what to do. So, Carolyn, how do I know if H is concave up? 
So H double prime has to be what? Okay, so we have to look at the second derivative. Now you get a point for this. Guys, nice. you're not going to behave. Okay, we just don't have time. Uh, okay, what h h prime of x? We already know this equals f of x. So what's h double prime of x? F prime of x. So we're looking where the slope of my graph is positive. So f prime of x has to be greater than zero. So I'm going to look up here, and I want f prime of x to be greater than zero. Looks like it's right here. Oh, it's a different color. It's here, and then it's from here to here. Probably true. It's, I don't know. I don't remember. No. They won't have it. I don't know if that's seven. I think my I think that's seven here. So where would it be positive from what? One, two, I can't read it. And then six to seven. The second derivative is always open parentheses. That's an always. First derivative. Nobody has come to agreement on that one. All I can say is read the question. If they were to ask you, when is a particle like increasing, you would look and say, well, that's what the velocity or the derivative is positive. So if my particle looked like this, and here's V, <coughs> where is the particle positive? There's 2 and there's 4. It would include 2, because it is positive at 2, but would it include 4, because it's 0 there. So sometimes, you just have to read the question and see if you have to worry about the parentheses. I, I asked this summer, <laughs> well, it won't help you now, but I, I believe they'll be picky about that. You could ask my listserv, too. So that graph would be of B of T? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. It's the derivative. Okay. So we got our concavity. Now, D says find the value of x at which h has its minimum on a closed interval. What theorem am I thinking about? No. Max min existence theorem. Max min. Now you get a point for identifying the critical points. I don't believe you have to say the theorem. It won't hurt you, but you don't have to say it. So where are the critical points? At x equals 1, 3, and where's the end point? Seven. Is it three? I can't, I'm sorry, I just can't read the graph. I want, where are the critical points? When f, f of x, which is h prime, right, equals zero. Not its maximum. I want h's maximum. So you have an endpoint here an endpoint here, and you have this point right there. And where is that? Is that at 6? Six? 6 or is it 5? Five? Five. 5, okay. Identify all the candidates. Why can it not, the minimum, not occur at 5? Because this is going from plus to minus, so it's a maximum. Kind of interesting. And then what would you do? You would just evaluate these. I kind of think you need to talk about 5 just to make sure that you throw it out. But I want to find h of 1. And we found h of 1. What was its value? That's an a. 0. Zero. h of 5, if you had to find the maximum, h of 5 is, is truly a relative maximum. What's happening here? The area keeps increasing, 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 and it maxes out here. So the area is positive, isn't it, from 1 to here? So that's positive. So we'll just say it's positive. And what about h of 7? Is it positive, or does it go to negative? It, it starts going back down, but is it going to go below 0? But you have to add all this in. I will just add it together with that. Does it become? It's still positive. 
So this would be my absolute minimum. Now had this graph come way down, what if it had done this? Then it would have been at the minimum would have been at seven. Okay, but it didn't, so we won't we'll cross that out. So that's not too bad, is it? This is a pretty classic problem. Um, it's 1995. It's more of a skeleton of what they give today. Today they have more words. But you'll see the same kinds of problems in them. Yeah, when you look at all the exams, that's the one thing you should do. Read the exams because you're going to look at them. And there's a lot of words. So we are going to, I have enough time to at least start this. Yeah. We are going to look at last year's exam. I uh, can't remember what number it is. Question two. It's the tea and biscuit problem. This is last year's. I graded this one. Thanks. So, out of hand, look at that. There's tons of words, aren't there? Where? I know. This is last year's exam, 2011, question two. Yeah, I graded this one. We may not get through it all. Your job is to finish it. Mrs. Hoosman may finish it tonight. Be nice. Only if you're going to get points for corrections. Otherwise, you can keep them. We'll have more of those little quizzes. Not too many more than running out of time. <laughs> As a pot of tea cools, the temperature of tea is modeled by H. Now, this is question two. It's a calculator problem. OK, Carolyn? Yeah. We're doing this problem. Time is measured in minutes. If they're going to ask me for units, I better keep track of that. And guess what they do using correct units. And the temperature is measured in degrees Celsius. So I'm just going to underline that so I keep that in mind. Values of H at selected times are shown in the table above. Use the data in the table to approximate the rate at which the temperature of the T is changing at time T equals 3.5. Show your comp computation. If you just come up with an answer, you get nothing. What's it asking for? I want the rate at which the temperature is changing. No. It's the slope, isn't it? What points are you going to use? If I want it at 3.5. Use these guys. So, which goes in the numerator? I saw a lot of these upside down. 52 minus 60 over 5 minus 2. That answer is sufficient, by the way. You do not have to simplify that, but we will. What's 52 minus 60? Because if you do it wrong, you're in trouble. Negative 8 thirds. Yeah, I like to see them simplified, but I don't like to take the point back when you do it wrong. How many points was that? I think it's just one. Just one. But if you don't have either this set up here or this set up there, you don't get the one. Okay? Where did I get what? Okay. Now, do you guys remember what B is asking for? It's one tenth of the integral from zero to ten of H of T. This is H of T here. What is that asking for? Average value of the function. Not average rate of change. Average value. Average rate of change would have been using 66 and 43 and finding the slope. Okay, so let's do that. I want the average value of the function. Okay, so what is that? That's the average temperature, right? And it says using correct units. What temperature? What's our temperature at? In degrees Celsius. I need a little more. Look, what else would I need? The 0 to 10 is important. During, you should. This was last year's exam. The first what? I guess say t equals 0 to t equals 10. 
units, okay? But make sure you include the units because it's said to do that. Now, did I get everything? So first I'm explaining the meaning, and then I'm going to use trapezoidal rule. Average temperature of the tea in degrees Celsius over the 10 minutes. Meaning of the expression. Was it? Oh, that's it. Now, you get a point for the trapezoidal sum. Do you remember that trapezoidal rule? Okay, so what I'm going to do is take a picture of this because I'm lazy. Oh, let's put it on a new page. And let's graph this. I can do this without graphing it, but some of you may prefer to graph it. Whoops. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at that. And we'll just estimate. So you guys can graph it while you're watching. Instead of watching me, you guys graph it. Oops, sorry. Crooked. I think it's okay. So we're just going to estimate. At zero, we're at 66. So I have this point at 2. And these are not equally divided. I'm going to be at 60. Then at 5, I'm going to be at 52, somewhere there. At 9, way out here, I'm going to be at 44. And at 10, I'm going to be at 43. Pretty close. Okay, Alexis, how do I do this? Natalie, how do I do this? We're going to draw on what? Trapezoids. So this trapezoid, and then there's this trapezoid, then this one, whoops, can't touch the board, and then this one. And it says four, and they're equal, um, not, this says four subintervals. Do you remember the formula for the trapezoidal rule? Andrew? What is it? It's the height times the average of the bases, or you can remember it this way. If you forget, draw a trapezoid, draw the diagonal, and the area of this is one half base one times the height. That's one half base two times the height. It's a quick way to remember. It's not time to go. Okay, so let's get this set up. Okay, we've got three minutes, five minutes really. Okay, so how do you do this? It's one half. Can I factor the one half out because it's the same in all of them? Then it's the height. Now be careful with your height. Your height is this length here. These are the bases. So this height is two. And the sum of the bases, they're listed right here. Six, 66 plus 60. Pay attention. If they give you a graph, let's say they're giving you the graph and the chart, you always use, what, Natalie? The chart. You never use the graph. Don't estimate. Plus, what's the next base? 3 times 60 plus 52. Don't bother memorizing the trapezoidal rule because we will give you nothing for it. Then I'll do these two. 5 to 9 is a 4 times 52 plus 44. It's a calculator problem. Plus 1 times 44 plus 43. Pardon? Oh, trapezoids are on the sides. The sides are, yeah, trapezoids are on the sides. That's good enough. You don't have to add it. You're done. You get a point for, let's say you mess these numbers up a little bit. If we can recognize you did the trapezoidal rule, you get a point for that, and then a point for putting them in the right numbers. Um, this is just the area, so then we'll take this whole thing to get the average value and divide by 10. Because that's what it was asking for. And I almost forgot, thank you for reminding me. What's for lunch today? No, only you can turn it in if you want to get uh, points back. No, you keep them. 